it's on or around the summer of 1983. I am 10 years old, and I've decided to take my mother sailing. I have just finished uh, Optimist Dinghy lessons, and I am full of new knowledge of the high seas. An Optimist Dinghy, for those of you who don't know, is essentially a plywood bathtub. It seats at the most two, and it has a, it has a mast in the middle of it on which you can put a sail. And I want my mom to see my new competence and my new skill. So down we head to Vancouver, British Columbia's English Bay. It is a glorious day. It's warm. The sun is out. The ocean is glassy and green, except for the occasional tastefully designed wave. Uh, looking across the bay, you can see the North Shore. It's close enough almost to touch. If you were Jesus in the mood for a walk, you could be there in a matter of minutes. And scattered around the bay, waiting for places to dock, are freighters. They look like Lego laid out on a carpet. It's a perfect day. So we put the Optimus dinghy together. There's not actually too much involved in putting it together. I put in the, uh, the tiller or the rudder, uh, the centerboard. I'm trying to remember all the terminology all these years later. Put in the mast and the sail. And out my mother and I go into, uh, into the ocean. And at first it goes really well. Uh, I am, uh, this is a reversal for me, and I'm a little thrown off by the reversal. Uh, it's not normal that I'm driving and my mom is the passenger. I'm, I'm uh, at the tiller and she is uh, uh, enjoying the ride. It's not uh, typical that I have knowledge and my mother is the observer. So I'm full of pride and adrenaline. And... Um, and, you know, like that, like Gilligan's Island, things, things go well until they don't. Uh, the waves start uh, coming. Maybe it's like that time in the Sea of Galilee when the disciples are out there and the storm comes up. Uh, the good news is an optimist dinghy is low to the water and therefore basically impossible to capsize. Even if you put your mind to it, it's really difficult to get one upside down. The bad news is an optimist dinghy is low to the water and therefore uh, the distinction between being on the waves and being in the waves is uh, amorphous and permeable. Uh, we, uh, we go over a few waves, kind of belly flop onto them with the big flat bottom of the boat, and then uh, the waves are coming over the side. Uh, I'm a competent sailor and a well-prepared one. I know what to do, so we dig out the, uh, the bailing bucket, and we start bailing, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. In very short order, we are swamped. Uh, we are now sitting up to our waists uh, in water, the Optimus dinghy remains buoyant, so it doesn't sink, but it's also unwilling to take us anywhere. And all of a sudden, uh, the water, which was warm a moment ago, is cold, and the shore, which was really close to the other shore, is far away, and the freighters, which were cute Lego-sized toys, are suddenly massive and surrounding us and ready to spin on their anchors and uh, like Ahab's whale, uh, pull us down into the depths. I feel the, the first taste of panic in my mouth. Um, uh, and strangely, my mom has no plan. Uh, my mom, who up until this moment has basically solved every problem uh, we have ever encountered, uh, 10 for 10 on the problem solving, uh, she too does not have a resolution uh, to this situation. Years from now, uh, years from this day, uh, when I hear theologians talk about water, how it shows up in scripture, how it shows up in the church, and how water is a multivalent symbol, multivalent being a $3 word that means it means a lot of different stuff and functions in a lot of different ways, I will think of this moment on English Bay with my mother. Uh, we need water to live, and it can drown us. Water washes us clean, and it also washes away buildings and uh, bridges and roads. We're made of water. We're mostly water. And if we drink too much of it, we become intoxicated, dangerously so. Water holds up a boat, and it also threatens to pull it down into the silty depths. 
So I am, I'm sitting here unsure what to do, um, something like panic starting to burble up, and even in the middle of it, the scene around me remains beautiful. The ocean is still beautiful, the mountains on the far side are still beautiful, uh, even the freighters in their danger are beautiful. In a funny way, the scene is beautiful because it's dangerous, not in spite of it. Fearfulness, maybe, is what the folks who wrote the Bible would call this moment. In case you're worried, uh, the story has a happy ending, a uh, fairly unremarkable one, actually. Someone on shore has a pair of binoculars, and they uh, see my mother and I in our unexpected bathtub, and uh, they come out in a, a motorboat, and they tow us to shore, and we go back wet and changed a kind of baptism. Psalm 112 uh, says, happy are they that fear the Lord. Uh, Hebrews says, I shall not fear for God is with me. These are, are, these are streams or themes that run through scripture. So uh, when Hagar, or sometimes Hagar, I guess, is... Um, is cast out of the camp and into the wilderness of Genesis with her child facing starvation. When God comes to Hagar, God says, do not be afraid. Uh, Deuteronomy says, you shall fear the Lord your God. Isaiah and Jeremiah speaking in God's voice say, uh, do not fear, God is with you. Second Chronicles says, this is how you shall live in fear of the Lord. How many times does Jesus say, do not be afraid? Uh, do not be afraid, your life is worth more than many sparrows. Do not be afraid, I shall make you fishers of people. Do not be afraid, it is I. And Jesus' mom, in her famous song, says, God's mercy is on those who fear God. Now, to be clear, I don't mind when scripture argues with scripture. This is not a problem that we need to solve. It is fine uh, that uh, Matthew and Luke have birth narratives that have trouble sort of joining together. That's, this is not a problem we need to solve. Uh, it, is, um, uh, it is fine that we hear about a God in Psalm 23 uh, who is our shepherd, who makes us lay down in, in, in green pastures, who leads us through the valley of death. And we also hear about a God in Acts who strikes down to a couple dead for not giving enough money to church. I've, I've sometimes wondered about doing a financial stewardship campaign uh, based, on, based on Acts. Please consider your, uh, your pledge to grace. Remember the couple from Acts. Uh, I don't... I'll, I'll ask Vestry about that later. Uh, so I don't, I don't mind, I don't mind that, um, that argument. I th isn't it cool that the ancients uh, were willing to write down in one collection of books that we call the Bible uh, all these different uh, sort of understandings of God, all these different ways they'd wrestled with God and wondered about God. And I don't actually think that that's what's happening here at all. I think that uh, there isn't an argument here uh, that the fear of the Lord, biblical holy fearfulness, and fearlessness, these things actually marry together. Uh, the fear of the Lord helps us to become fearless. There's a few overlapping reasons for that. The first is that the fear of the Lord, biblical or holy fearlessness, is something, or fearfulness, excuse me, is something different than the fear of the world. So God is not uh, a drunken, angry dad who can turn his rage on us at any time. When, it says, when, when scripture says, fear the Lord, that doesn't mean uh, fear God as you would be afraid of heights or as you would be afraid of a snake, or as you would be afraid of um, someone who's capable of violence. Rather, I, I want to suggest that the fear of the Lord is more like that moment when you were in a concert hall, 
and something impossibly beautiful is taking place on stage, and you are afraid to make a noise lest you ruin what you are seeing. That is fearfulness. That is the fear of the Lord. Or when you are holding a newborn child, and you are fearful of dropping this child, all of your energy goes into not dropping uh, this, uh, this beautiful and fragile person. Or when you've been trusted with something by someone. You've been trusted with a task, you've been trusted with a confidence, and uh, you take that seriously. Uh, you are fearful of not uh, living up to the trust that's been given to you. This is the fear of God. I think also um, fearfulness, biblical fearfulness, and worldly fearlessness go together because when you have had an experience of, of fearing God, a lot of everyday stuff just stops seeming all that important. When you've sat on English Bay wondering if you've just set the stage for the drowning of your mother, then the possibility that there's a typo in your grade five essay is, is this is maybe not the sort of thing that's gonna keep you awake at night anymore. I think about my own God sightings in my life, being present when my children were born, uh, being with people when they die, uh, being with people as they share uh, longings and griefs and, and experiences of beauty. And, and through those God sightings, uh, the small stuff just doesn't seem that big a deal. Uh, some fight over where the bouquet is going to go at the wedding uh, just doesn't seem as important maybe as it did before. It's not to say that I never get dragged into petty fights. I do. Uh, but maybe, maybe I can pull out uh, of the nosedive a little faster than I could before. And I think also uh, these experiences of holy fearfulness of... Um, of fearing God uh, leave us changed. Uh, when we have these encounters, we come out with often a deep okayness. I think this is what Liz was talking about a few weeks ago when she shared her, uh, her near-death experience with us. She talked about, you may remember, almost dying uh, in the, back in the 90s and how uh, that actually was an immensely peaceful experience. And, uh, and, 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 uh, and I don't know, it's worth the, the limits of language here, a, a glimpse of holiness for her. Uh, and that, she, you know, she has peace that flows out of that experience that remains with her still. Uh, there is this okayness that shows up when we see the truly fearful. Now, none of this is to say uh, that by having a God sighting, by having fear of God, we end up immune to trauma or we end up immune to disappointment or immune to grief. We don't. Uh, we know that we do not. Christians, uh, even really mature Christians, do not levitate through life being uh, unbothered by anything. Rather, I wonder if seeing holy fear of, uh, fearfulness means that even as the fears of the world remain, you know, when, when I'm on my bike and someone in a car does, uh, makes up the rules of the road, I still end up shaking uh, when that happens, when uh, someone does something that disappoints me or wasn't what I wanted or um, uh, wasn't what I trusted them to do. Uh, I still, that still hurts. I wrote about that in the Grace Notes this week, uh, my, my anger and disappointment uh, about... Um, uh, the development in our, uh, in our campus project. Uh, what, I think, what I think it means to have uh, encountered and trust in the fear of God is you, have just, you don't have as far to fall uh, when you encounter worldly fear. Uh, you have this trust that God will catch you. Uh, the cross is still real, unfair things are still real, and we have this trust that they're not the end of our story. We have this trust that the story ends with resurrection. To fear God is to know that, um, how does the song go? Uh, God will hold you in the palm of God's hand. It is to trust that 
in spite of everything, God will hold you up like the ocean holds up a boat. <laughs>